tell you we've recently completed looking at helping people with writing. So a little bit of background. We know that writing impairments are very, very common in aphasia, but historically we've tended to give them far less attention both as therapists and as researchers. Uh, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. So historically there's been less attention to writing in uh, both in, in therapies and in research than there has been to spoken language. But the picture is, I think, is shifting because increasingly we are using writing for everyday communication as we're shifting much more towards email, social media and so on for our communication. Which means that people with aphasia who have writing impairments are at a growing risk of digital exclusion. There was a review of treatments for writing aphasia carried out by Teal and colleagues in 2015. And what they found is that within the evidence base, first of all, there are very, very few group studies and no randomized trials at this, at this point. Most of the studies that have been carried out were single case impairment therapy studies and most of those were looking at single word spelling. So there's a little bit of a gap between the sorts of things that we're doing in therapy and in research versus the ways that we actually use writing in our everyday lives. They, they found that there is an emerging evidence base looking at technological interventions, so that included a few studies which were using technology to augment impairment therapies, and there are a few studies also that are beginning to look at using technology as a compensatory strategy, so using things like voice recognition. So that's, that's our, our starting point here. Now, a year after that review, my colleague Anna Cote and I published, uh, again, a single case study, but that was looking at using assistive technology, so using voice recognition. And we worked with um, a gentleman we called Stephen, who was 63 years old, and he was two years post-stroke when we met him. Before his stroke, he had been a secondary school head teacher. He'd been unable to go back to work because of his aphasia. And he was hugely frustrated by this loss of his professional identity. He had fluent aphasia, but with severe dyslexia and severe dysgraphia. And we gave him 16 hours of therapy, training him to use Dragon voice recognition. And this produced some really dramatic gains in his functional writing. So if I show you at baseline, one of our assessments was uh, an email writing task. At baseline, he wasn't able to produce a single correctly spelled word. Whereas once he was using Dragon, this is the kind of writing that he was able to produce. And I remember at the time being really struck by Having worked in aphasia and aphasia therapy and research for too many years dementia, I had never ever worked with somebody where we had this dramatic a change in their communication within such a small number of hours of therapy. And it didn't just change on the assessments, this had a really transformatory uh, impact on his life, his activities, his well-being and his sense of identity. And so I really felt, or with colleagues we really felt that this was something that merited some further study in a, in a larger project. And that led us on to the Communicate project, which took place at City and was funded by the Barts Charity. The Communicate research team, um, I'll just point out that we are a team that it comprises speech and language therapy researchers, as well as human computer interaction researchers. And the Communicate project, this is a much bigger project looking at technology in aphasia therapy, and it has four, four strands, but I'm only going to talk about the writing strand this morning. So our main research questions for the writing strand are, does technology enhance therapy improve functional writing? So does the therapy make a difference? And secondly, are those gains, if there are any gains, confined to the technology-assisted writing, or do they also show that we ask people to, to do a handwritten task? So we're exploring whether the technology is providing a compensatory um, gain, or whether it's actually improving the underlying uh, writing impairment. 
we use for this a weightless control design. So you can see in the sort of the middle section, we've got two groups. One group who, after their baseline assessment, goes straight into therapy for six weeks. We have a second group who they have after the first baseline, they have a six week gap. Then they have a second baseline before they then also receive the therapy. So this means that at that second assessment point, we've got one group who have received intervention and one group who haven't yet had intervention that we can compare. Um, and people were randomised to those two groups. Our main outcome measure is a functional writing assessment, which I'll show you in a moment. And the therapy comprised a couple of hours of initial technology training, just to make sure people were comfortable and confident with the basics of using the technology before we sent them home um, to use it and to use it in the therapy. And that was then followed by two therapy sessions a week for six weeks. And our group included 21 people, all with aphasia following stroke, mixture of men and women. Um, average age was 56 years and of importance is that this is a group with very chronic aphasia, so the mean time post onset is 57 months. Our outcome measure, we decided to use a measure which was quite close to everyday narrative writing, and this was adapted from our previous case study. So it, it works around three writing tasks. One is to write an email, which is a very constrained task, so these are the instructions that we would give people. So we really um, determine what we want them to include in that email. The second is a less constrained task. We ask them to write about, um, imagine you've won the lottery, what, would you, what are you going to do? So we give some constraint. And the third one is an unconstrained task. So we ask them to write about some news, which could be some real news that they've seen um, on the TV or something. It could be some personally relevant news or it could be something they just make up creatively. And we presented these tasks in two conditions, handwriting and using the technology. The technologies that we used in the study were Write Online and Dragon Voice Recognition. Write Online, if you're not familiar with it, is an assistive word processor for people with dyslexia. It includes some features that might be helpful to people with aphasia, like word prediction, text-to-speech, and mind maps and word bars. Um, I'll point out that Write Online has been replaced with Docs Plus, which has very similar features. So an example of a Write, on wo write Online word bar is that you can set up personalized tabs where you put in vocabulary or phrases, which means that somebody only needs to be able to scan through and select the word or phrase that they want. They don't need to generate any spelling, though there is also a keyboard so they can <coughs> Dragon voice recognition, so the idea if somebody has got superior spoken output, you can use that to bypass their writing difficulties. And there are an iPad version and a PC version of Dragon. And similar functions we've now got built in with things like Siri. So the intervention, the 12 hours of therapy over the six weeks, involved um, facilitated practice in writing using those technologies, developing writing strategies, and working on writing personalised content. So some people would write emails, people could write their own personal story, or um, work on writing Facebook posts, depending on what they wanted to address. And we worked out uh, collaboratively goals with each individual around their technology skills, their written communication, and their social participation through the therapy. So does it work? So first of all, the comparison between the treated and the untreated groups. If we think about, first of all, their people's ability to write words, do they produce more words or more correctly spelled words? The answer that we found was that only the treated group has improved and only when they're using the technology. So the blue line you see is the treated group using the technology. The red line is the treated group when they're handwriting. We also looked at grammatical quality of the writing and exactly the same picture. Only the treated group improved, and only when they're using the technology. And we looked at social validity. So this is um, ratings by blind raters. They don't know which group or which time point they're rating. And they look at the informativeness, the uh, effectiveness, and the comfort of reading those messages. And we get, again, same kind of picture. The treated group 
is improved much more and only really when they're using the technology. So it looks like the technology is working and providing a compensatory effect. We then combined all of the results together because I said after the second time point, the delayed group now also receives the therapy. So we now looked at everybody's results together for pre and post therapy and also a follow up. And again, it's a very, very positive picture. So on all three of those measures, the lexical quotient, grammatical quality and social validity, the whole group have improved on all of those measures, but only when they're using the technology. Again, that's the blue, the blue lines on the graphs. So that confirms our feeling that the technology is working to compensate. We collected qualitative interview feedback. Um, and people talk very movingly about how, what a difference using this technology for writing was making in their lives, giving them greater autonomy, greater confidence, and enabling social participation. So our conclusions were that 21 people with chronic aphasia were able to use mainstream, low-cost assistive technologies to improve their functional narrative writing. The therapy was effective with a modest dose which is realistic to be delivered in clinical settings and that the technology was compensated <coughs> for writing difficulties. And importantly, that the gains generalised beyond just our tests into everyday writing activities. So people were writing emails or personal stories and so on. And the feedback from participants was overwhelmingly positive. And we have just earlier this year published this study online, if you'd like to read a bit more of the detail of it. Thank you. Possibly with some of the participants, how were they able to self-edit if they had? Did anyone have dyslexia? How was that first gentleman able to? That's a really, really good question. So um, we also, in the first study, we also used um, some software that could provide text to speech, so read and write gold, um, so that so that Stephen could listen back to what he'd written, and also when he started to use his writing for emails and so on, he could read what people were sending to him. So yes, it was a combination of technologies. Further questions? Oh, yes. That was lovely, thank you. Um, I just wondered, you mentioned the two different kinds of softwares, which look like they work in rather different ways, from my understanding of Dragon, which presumably is pretty much purely speech to text. Yes. How did you choose? How did it differ according to participants and how easy they could use them? Yeah, so, again, very, very good question. Um, so we, we carried out some screening assessments um, and we also looked at the kind of technologies people were able to use and, and the kind of <coughs> skills people had in learning to use new technologies as well. So we had various um, things that went into the decision about which technology was most appropriate. <coughs> um, we used Dragon as the first sort of um, most appropriate offer for people who had significantly better spoken output than written output and where their spoken output was um, clear and consistent. So it wouldn't work for somebody who has inconsistent, say, dyspraxic speech or significant disaster. Um, right online, we tended to use for people who had more severe um, aphasia, although some people with mild aphasia also chose right online. Uh, so right online doesn't require um, any particular spoken output, but people did need to have um, either a, a baseline level of either reading comprehension for single words to enable them to scan through and select the correct word from the choice, or a baseline level of auditory comprehension, because right online will also um, do text-to-speech, so you can, you can listen to the words before you select them. 
but I certainly I worked with one gentleman using Write Online who had really very severe aphasia and he had no written output other than being able to write his own name and his partner's name. And he was successfully able to use Write Online to generate simple emails and make appointments and so on. So it's, it was a mixture of the language profile and the technology sort of aptitude. Now, if anyone has any more questions for Sydney, I'd be 